Well, welcome everybody to the Tough Topics Digital Conference and welcome back for our third session. We are excited to be back to explore another topic. Our goal with these topics is to spark curiosity in you. We hope that that you're challenged to, uh, to, to dig back into these ideas. Some of these things that we're talking about, um, you know, as we unpack them, we realize we haven't really thought deeply about them. And our goal in this is to, to, to move those conversations forward, um, both in our own kind of exploration and in the conversations we have with one another. Keep in mind, it's not a debate. We are not trying to, um, to push you towards a specific view. And we, uh, we are not trying to, to go back and forth in a debate manner with, with our speaker today. That's not, that's, not, that's not the design of it. Also, we want you to remember that we're, we're putting out a lot of content over, over these two weeks of this conference. And if you're feeling a little overwhelmed by that, just, just know that we're, we're gonna be unpacking it for a while. So you don't have to retain everything. You don't have to learn everything in real time. Um, we'll be spending a lot of time with these ideas in relationship and community over, over the coming weeks and months. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to uh, John. All right. So today we have Dr. Preston Sprinkle joining us again. So uh, let me pull up his bio. So Dr. Preston Sprinkle he has a PhD from Aberdeen University in Scotland, and he serves as the president of the Center for Faith, Sexuality, and Gender. Preston is New York Times bestselling author. He's written several books, including Erasing Hell, Karis, Living in a Gray World, People to be Loved, and recently released small group learning experience, Grace and Truth 1.0 and 2.0. Preston has given talks to thousands of people worldwide on the topic of faith, sexuality, and gender. So Dr. Sprinkle, thanks for joining us. Oh, I think you're muted. There we go. Thanks for having me on. It's good to be here. <laughs> <laughs> Happens to the best of us. Um, before we even get into this topic on faith, sexuality, and gender, Preston, I just want to say I'm so grateful as a pastor these issues for all of your work um, that you have done on this to help me think clearly and to help me understand this this whole topic which um, can is is really really important as I'm sitting across from people and talking to people about these things so I personally am so grateful for your work it is so needed so um, thank you so much my pleasure thank you um, so Let's uh, let's just kind of dive into this. Um, first of all, your story a little bit. How did how did this become a topic that you picked up and really started teaching on and working through? Yeah, interesting story, I guess. Um, I I started. Well, my my heart is you know I, I'm an academic. I'm a I was a college professor for a number of years. I love theology. I love digging really deep into topics and just wrestling with the, the intellectual side of things. And so uh, several years ago, I was teaching at a college and students were asking me, you know, about the topic of homosexuality. And I, I could see that it, you know, was becoming at that time <laughs> um, a really hot topic and people were starting to ask questions. And so I decided to kind of dig into researching what does the Bible say about homosexuality. And yeah, it's important for me to say I, it began I began as a research topic it was just more of an intellectual inquiry into what the Bible says but early on in that journey of mine I ended up getting to know several um, LGBT people just to sit down hear their story um, e even though I am an academic I, I'd love to humanize topics and I love to um, especially if a topic is directly affecting or is about actual people I'm a big fan of getting to know those people, right? Um, and I was just really blown away at, when I got to know LGBT people, blown away at how mistreated they had been by Christians. You know, one of the most common responses I got from people was, I've never met a Christian that was kind to me. Or many of the people I talked to, whether they were still in a church or not, you know, said they grew up in the church, and then I'd ask them about what that was like. And, um, I mean, some real, and I'll say horror stories with some people. I mean, just unbelievable ways in which people were treated, mistreated, uh, dehumanized, mocked, made fun of, shame. The, sh the amount of shame that LGBT people have endured from the church is, is astounding. 83%, just so we all know, 83% of LGBT people were raised in the church. 83%. So that's like the overwhelming majority of, you know, that gay community over there that, you know, Christians think it's like, oh, that's, that's a, that's a, 
they're over there and the church is over here, you know, it's kind of us and them, you know, well, maybe there isn't an us, them kind of, you know, mentality in the air. Oh, 83%, millions and millions and millions of LGBT people grew up in the church. Uh, 51% ended up leaving by the time they turn 18, but only 3% said they left primarily for theological disagreement that the church believes in a traditional view of marriage. They don't, they think, you know, same sex sexual relationships are immoral. 3% said they left for those reasons primarily, which means the overwhelming majority left for relational reasons that they, they were shamed, they were mocked, they were ignored. They were, they were scared to just be at church <laughs> while they were wrestling with their sexuality. So anyway, long story short, that just really threw me into a tailspin. Um, I did, it, it, you know, in my theological journey, I did come to the conclusion that, uh, that mar- God designed marriage to be between a man and a woman and all sexual relationships outside that covenant bond, I, I, the Bible says are sin. Okay. So I do hold to a traditional theological view. I do think it's clear in scripture. Um, at the same time, I think the church uh, has generally done a really horrific job um, not caring for, not loving, not embodying the, the radical love and grace of Jesus toward those who experience same-sex sexual attraction or, you know, um, some kind of gender incongruence. So, uh, so I'm living in, I guess I, you could say I'm living in this middle space of um, trying to uh, change the church's posture and how we even go about this conversation. Um, and yet also um, uh, understanding, teaching, and even defending a traditional view of, of marriage and sexuality. Yeah, uh, that's what I appreciate so much about your perspective on this is how you you never dehumanize it and you focus so much on the people. I think that's so important for us to remember. So could you share just a, a story or two from your interactions with people that, that's kind of typical of your experiences? Inter- in, sorry, clarify interactions with um, like LGBT people or people yeah. just on this topic or? Just share a story or two of an LGBT person or something who grew up in the church or an, an ex- one of their experience that, that you've um, heard their story. Yeah, yeah. Well, one of my friends, uh, their name's Leslie, um, ex- has experienced gender dysphoria from the time they were four years old and uh, grew up in the church, madly in love with Jesus. Um, when Leslie was a teenager, uh, they went to the pastor to um, to tell their pastor, hey, I'm, I'm, I love Jesus, I'm a Christian, you know, but I'm really wrestling with my gender identity. I don't know, I don't know what to do, the, do with this, you know, I just, all I know is I want to serve Jesus or whatever. Can you help me to do that, you know? And the pastor kicked her out of the church and invited Leslie to never come back again. And Leslie didn't for 18 years, you know, live, um, you know, as part of the, <laughs> the, gay, the gay community over there. You know, this is what's interesting is like, there's so many layers and layers and layers of stories and journeys that underlies that LGBT community. And, and, and many of those layers of stories, the church is wrapped up into that story in a very, in a very negative way. I mean, this is going to sound a little over the top, but I don't mind doing that just to provoke thought. You know, it's almost like the, the conservative church has almost single-handedly created the LGBT community because so many of them were raised in a church. And, and there, if, as a human, you're going to find, you're going to seek for love and community somewhere. If you can't find it in the church, if you can't find love in the church, you're going to find it elsewhere. And now somebody's going to jump in and say, well, yeah, well, they don't believe the truth. Again, yeah, 3% left because of the truth. The rest of them left because they were shamed and mocked and made fun of. So we can't just make this about like, um, oh, they rejected the truth. That's why they had to go find, you know, pseudo love in another community or whatever. Um, so yeah, it, there's loads of, I mean, gosh, I, where do I start? There's, um, I'll, I'll stop there. If you want another one, I can share another one. But there's, um, it, it was those stories that really caused me to dive in and make this conversation a, a main thing and a main part of my ministry for the last several years. Yeah. Uh, in that vein, do you have any stories of individuals who were really treated well by the church and stories that the church really represented the love of Christ and and balance the love of Christ and the truth in a way that you think it was admirable. Yeah, one of my friends, um, 
uh, he was a young worship leader in his early 20s. This is probably 20 years ago. He was in a conservative Baptist church, large, ba large Baptist church, worship leader, um, was wrestling with his sexuality, experienced an attraction to the same sex as a worship leader. And he ended up acting on that against the church's standard. Okay, went and you know, um, had a sexual relationship with another guy. Then he came clean. And he, uh, in front of the whole church, came, came clean. This is 20 years ago in a conservative church. You're like, oh man, how'd that go? Well, people flocked to him. They lined up thanking him, forgiving him, and confessing their own sin to him, saying, well, I've been, you know, lusting after this person. I've, I've had an affair. I've slept around, you know, and like, thank you for having the courage to say where well, you've messed up. God forgives you, and I hope God can forgive me too. And it's really a beautiful thing. You know, Oddly enough, it was the only the main person that had a problem with him confessing his sin was a pastor. <laughs> uh, but it was really, I mean, a really, uh, I mean, that gives me a lot of hope. I mean, again, that was 20 years ago. I think a lot more churches that that would be pretty typical these days. I mean, wherever I go and speak, evangelicals, by and large, have a deep passion and want to do a better job in this conversation. And when I share that story, they're like, oh, I would totally be the first one in, in the line confessing my sin and embracing a fellow brother in Christ. Uh, but 20 years ago in a conservative church, that, that, that wasn't, you know, it's pretty rare. But um, he's still walking with the Lord, been a Christian for, you know, I think he's in his, what, late 40s now. Um, he's still single. He's still faithful. I mean, he's, he's um, yeah, just amazing. And I, I don't know if he would have, if, if he wasn't received in that way, I don't know if he would have still been walking with the Lord. So it's a really beautiful thing to see the church embody in the kindness of God um, in such a way that helped nurture his, his faith commitment to this day. Yeah, thanks. That's really, really encouraging to hear um, that story. And um, now let's kind of change gears just a little bit and I think what's really, really helpful for me, at least in this whole conversation was clarifying terms and just understanding what I'm talking about. And when we hear these terms thrown around, just know, knowing what is being meant by them. So um, can you talk about things like, uh, like gender, biological sex, gender identity, gender role? What, what is usually meant by those? Um, and and how, how do we clarify what these terms mean? Gender is the most, how, how do I say, well, it's kind of confusing, but more misunderstood, honestly. Um, so, yeah, for, you know, up until the 1970s, uh, sex and gender were, were synonyms. Sex isn't like biological sex. So, like, you know, you're, you're male or you're female, or maybe there's a small percentage of people who might be born with an intersex condition where they're both male and female. Um, but for most of humanity, you know, we're either male or female, and the words sex or gender were used to describe that reality. Well, after the 70s, um, there's, you know, social scientists and psychologists began to say, well, you know, the male or female experience is a bit more complicated than just our bodies. You have our social environment, you have expectations of masculinity and femininity, which aren't necessarily, you know, you have some males that are clearly male, but aren't very masculine. And what does that mean? And so they began to use gender as a term in, in, to capture either the psychological aspect of being male or female or the social aspect of being male or female. Again, you know, masculinity or femininity. The, these concepts, masculinity and femininity, are largely uh, social constructs. Like what it means to be masculine, you know, means what? You're, you're athletic, you're, um, you're kind of you know, hard worker, you're tough, you can beat up somebody who tries to beat you up, you're not emotional, you know, because lust and anger aren't, aren't emotions, apparently, <laughs> you know, so we have all these, you know, social ideas of what masculinity is, and so if you're a male that loves art more than football and maybe cries during movies, then, well, you're not masculine. Well, where did that come from? Like, let's, largely our society that kind of creates that. Um, so, okay, so yeah, so, so gender, so you have now you have sex. That's just the biological reality. You're either male or female or a small percentage or intersex. Gender is now used to describe either gender role, masculinity or femininity, the social expectations for what it means to be a man or woman, or gender identity. 
gender identity has to do with, and the, the definition is one's internal sense of who they are, the psychology that one might um, have as a male or female. And for some people, they might be biologically male, but their gender identity, according to the definition, their internal sense of who they are might be female. And that raises all kinds of questions. Like, what does that even mean to have an internal sense that's different than your biological sex? And that, that's where it just, the whole conversation gets, just starts to really snowball. The most confusing thing though, is that people still use gender to refer to biological sex in one sentence and then the next sentence they use it in a, in a, in a different way. Or even like, you know, I hear people say, gender identity is the gender that you identify with but you can't use a term you can't define a term by using that very term that you're trying to define but you see that in really well-known organizations it's like gender identity is the gender that you identify with well you you've already distinguished gender from sex so if gender isn't sex then what is gender well it's what you identify okay well i get that is it but that it's just like a looping effect and you see this among really smart people or i mean look at your passport it doesn't say what sex you are it asks you your gender well, when everybody's defining gender in terms of your internal sense of who you, who you are, that's not what your passport's asking about. It's asking for your biological sex. And then, I mean, yeah, anyway, so <laughs> I can keep going on, but you can see where when the term gender is so nebulous and flexible and it can mean so many different things and be defined in so many different ways, it makes a thoughtful conversation almost impossible. Um, so that's just a starting point. There's a lot of other terms that we can add to the chaos, but I'll stop there for now. <laughs> no, I think that's good. And maybe I missed it. Did you did you address the the term gender role? I, I know you addressed the concept, but okay. So yeah, so you have uh, gender is the overarching term. Under gender, you you break it down to gender role. That's the social expectations for being a male or female, or masculinity, femininity, or shorthands for gender role. And then gender identity is the internal sense of who you are. So one's the social aspect, one's the psychological aspect. Both of those are under the umbrella of gender when gender is used and distinguished from being distinguished from sex. Beautiful. Thank you for that clarification. Um, can, so when somebody approaches you, so you kind of mentioned that this is where it gets kind of fuzzy um, and it gets difficult to address what's really being meant here, but somebody approaches you and says, you know, can somebody be born in the wrong body or have the wrong mind or wrong soul? I, I think you addressed this in one of your blogs. Uh, how do you, how do you, where do you go from that with that conversation? Yeah, that, that's a, there's a lot of philosophical and scientific, let alone theological um, complexity and misunderstanding that goes into this conversation. Yeah. Can you, can so, even that phrase, I love it. Can someone be born in the wrong body? Or let's just say, let's put it positively. Somebody was born in the wrong body. That's a prof, that's a, that's a profound philosophical assumption about human nature it means that this idea of someone that personality can be disembodied does that square with a christian theology or even science you know there's there's several scientists who would say that we're, we can't there is no you that is completely separated from your body i mean just on a scientific level let alone on, on, on a philosophical level some people would have have that understanding but you have to uh, justify that so there's two, I, I would say there's two main I would say thoughtful arguments in favor of somebody or th that are made for somebody being born in the wrong body. They may not use that phrase, but that's the concept. Um, one theory is that somebody could have the body of, for instance, have a male body, but a female brain. And this relies on the assumption that there are such a thing as male and female brains. And it also assumes that somebody could be born with the wrong brain, you know. Um, that might be the best argument in favor of somebody whose gender identity is different than their biological sex and that their gender identity is actually a more accurate reflection of who they are. That if they identify as female, even though they have a male body, well, maybe they have a female brain and that's why they identify as female. Now, I will say, um, I, I, the science just isn't there yet. I'll say yet because science is always changing and progressing and there's studies coming out all the time, but there, there's less scientific evidence. I'll say that there are such absolute things as male brains and female brains. There are generalities. I mean, if you, if you line up a hundred women across from a hundred men, 
you're going to have general differences in how they think, their emotions, their interests, and so on, but their generality is not absolute. In other words, if, if somebody, you know, if a male really likes pink, they're very emotional, they don't like sports, they, you know, identify with femininity, that doesn't, and you can say, well, that's because I have a female brain. It's like, well, or you just have a brain and you're a male and you have more stereotypically feminine interests. That doesn't necessarily mean you are a, a female. Um, so that's the, it's, it's a brain sex theory that somebody could be born with a brain of the opposite sex. So again, I'm going to say scientifically, there's not evidence. I would say no evidence. There's, you know, there's a study here and there that seems to prove it. But over, overall, the science does not suggest that. So if you see somebody saying it is, they don't, they haven't, they need to read a bit more. Um, the other theory is that is, is more of a, a philosophical or theological theory that somebody could have a, for instance, a male body and a female soul that, um, you know, but that, again, that, that, I think that one's a, le a bit harder to kind of prove. I mean, again, what does that even mean? Like, how, how would you, how would you describe somebody that has a male body and a female soul? Like tr try to do that without falling into stereotypes, <laughs> you know? How, how do you know something has a female soul? You, you're going to, it's impossible. You're going to start describing what I kind of did earlier, you know, where they like chick flicks and they don't like sports and all this stuff. It's like, all you're doing is relying on cultural stereotypes to, um, and then you get a blood test and determine someone's soul. Like the whole idea of a in, disembodied soul in your body, like that's, you're dealing with some really complicated, unprovable theories about human nature. So all that to say, um, yeah, I do think, um, it, it, when all the dust is settled, I do think that from a Christian standpoint, that our bodies, our sexed bodies, are, are a big deal, like are a, are a significant means of determining our uh, identity as humans, as divine image bearing humans. Um, our sex bodies are significant for that, even if for whatever reason, one's mind really doesn't resonate with, with their body. All right. Thanks for that. Yeah. Let's, uh, let's go back into some of the, some of the practical um, implications of this. Um, thanks for outlining those very complex uh, uh, philosophies, theologies, uh, scientific realities, those things. So clearly appreciate that. Um, so for, for parents or in households where perhaps a, a teenager or a young man or woman is really struggling with this, uh, what advice or resources would you point them to, to have this conversation with their children and their families? Are you, are you asking specifically for the, the gender piece or just LGBT as a whole? Um, let's just, let's stick to the LGBT as a whole. Okay, yeah. If that's not um, too broad. Yeah, no, that's good. I mean, I, th I think, parents and and leaders and mentors you know in 2020 we just we can't we can't not be informed on this conversation so that'd be my first piece of advice is um just really set aside some time i mean if you're if you're a christian of any kind of influence over your you know whether you have kids or you're a youth leader or you're a campus leader or a pastor or whatever if you have people you are discipling um it's only a matter of time before they come to you wanting help to navigate the complex field of sexuality and gender. I don't know a single person that's not asking questions about this. So to, to just ignore it is not an option. So, um, so then where do you start? And I guess, you know, I think just start with, there's a lot of stuff you can, there's a lot of good stuff you can read or even watch. There's a ton of really terrible stuff <laughs> because of this thing called the internet, right? I mean, goodness, anybody with a keyboard and an internet connection could pretend like they're an authority on whatever. So um, this is going to sound, I don't know, this is going to sound self-serving. It's not really, you know, it's not designed to be self-serving, but this is why we created our ministry, the Center for Faith, Sexuality, and Gender. We have a, a whole website, centerforfaith.com, that um, if you're resonating with, my perspective maybe um there's loads of resources on there you can get i mean just blogs and uh, um, free papers that we address certain questions there's books we're putting out and small group resources and videos and so on and so forth um yeah i i, I yeah at the risk of being self-serving i would say go to our website and and spend spend a couple hours you know searching around looking at stuff seeing what um might be a good place to go and there, there's lots of other books I can I can recommend if you want but I, I would really I mean I 
even though I'm an academic, I'm kind of biased, but I, I would start with just getting your mind ra wrapped around this, this topic. And I would also say, I mean, while you're studying some of the theological, ethical, even scientific questions, make sure you're always, always, always um, uh, studying the relational side of this, listening to people whose experience with same-sex sexual sexuality, you know, um, listening to their stories and learning from people who are, you know, sexual gender minorities who are, you know, LGBTQ, um, really making sure that as we're wrestling with the intellectual side of this, we're always, always, always engaging the, the human side of this. And those are two of an airplane. Once one wing, you know, starts to drop off, the plane crashes. Okay, so make sure you're devoting equal time to the, the, the science, the theology, but also to the, the relational side of this. Amen to that. And yeah, I... Uh, I would definitely second what you said. Your resource, your uh, uh, Center for Faith, Gender, and Sexuality uh, is so good. Um, I, I had been browsing all the free articles for a while, and then I finally realized, like, I need to support you financially. So I, so I paid for stuff. So um, really appreciate all of the work that you've done. It's so, it's so helpful. I definitely recommend checking that out, too. Um, and finally, last question for me is, we, again, we have a lot of young families in our church with young kids. So um, when, when do we talk about this with kids? Um, and how, or perhaps if you're comfortable like bringing in some of your personal experiences, how did you talk about it with your kids? Um, and, and just some general guidelines for how to have this conversation with young kids. Good question. I would say as early as you can in an age appropriate manner, you know. Um, Again, unless you're living on some commune without an internet connection, I don't care how much you homeschool your kids or whatever. I mean, your kids are, I homeschool my kids and they, they learn stuff all the time because they have, we have the, an internet connection in our home and they have friends and they, you know, it's, in this day and age, people are talking about sexuality and gender questions way earlier than when I grew up, you know, when you guys grew up, I'm sure. Um, you know, I've, I've got... Um, kids that are in elementary school down the street who identify as trans, bisexual, gender fluid. Half of them probably don't know what that means, but there's, you know, there's people are grasping for an identity and understanding of who they are. And there's such a push in some circles to find out who you are, you know? And so there's, I think there's just lots of confusion. And so in order to disciple our kids through that confusion, we need to begin these conversations early. I read somewhere that psychologically kids will typically see as authoritative the source they hear about something from first. So if they are in kindergarten, like in California, kindergarten, first grade, they're already learning this stuff. And then if you wait until, you know, 13 to go through the passport to purity or whatever you're the kid, you, you lost seven years. <laughs> you know, they, they've already been bathed in a secular ideology. They, you may not know it. They may not, you know, tell you about it, but like they're already absorbing um, ideas about sexuality and gender that probably aren't going to resonate with a Christian worldview. Um, and so, yeah, we needed to begin early a, with an age appropriate. I'm not saying we need to talk about like, you know, oral sex with our five-year-old kid or like there's certain things we don't need to start there, but to, to start to normalize sexuality, our sex, our bodies, you know, and what it means to be attracted emotionally romantically even sexually i mean th these are conversations we can begin early i don't you know you say yes or personal stories uh, on the one hand parenting is it's like fixing a flat tire on a rolling car so i don't want to be the I, I don't know i feel nervous saying here's what i did right in this work you know i'm like every every night my head hits the pillow i'm like thinking all the things i did wrong so and, and also like because this is my full-time job I mean, I've got books on sexuality laying over the house. Sometimes I have to cover them with a paper bag or something because the covers are like explicit. You know? <laughs> like, <laughs> um, I, so, I mean, it, it's, it's sort of in the air in my home. So it's, it's been easier for, for me to have these conversations because, you know, hey, where are you going this week to speak? And what are you speaking on, Dad? And, oh, sexuality again. You know, we know the drill. And so, so they're, they, they're, it's just sort of we're always kind of talking about it. But I do think that that, is rather than having the sit down beginning to end talk, you know, I think it's better to just kind of, you know, sexuality and gender is 
is such an it's so such a part of our humanity like it we think about it whether we know it or not you know all the time we're constantly reflecting on our bodies and attractions are coming and going and so i think to 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 make it just part of the rhythm of discipleship conversations in the home is probably the best thing to do and then it doesn't become this awkward oh no here comes a talk again you know it's it's just more just like oh this is just normal you know um which again, I think my generation and older sometimes didn't, we made it awkward, right? It's like, oh my gosh, my mom gave me the sex talk at 25, you know? Um, <laughs> I heard a story about that, so I'll save you. <laughs> so I think it was his mom, man. I think it was like 22, she sat him down. He's like, are you serious? Like, as if I don't know this stuff. But um, yeah, I'll, I'll stop there. That's awesome. I Just to pivot, I, I want to talk about, um, so, People, and I think there's a lot of people uh, who, who maybe been in the evangelical church for a long time who would, who would probably openly acknowledge we haven't handled this great, and, and we being kind of all of us, right? But I also think there's a lot of, of fear about the idea of giving up ground, right? Of if, you know, if I, if I do this, if I, um, maybe if I use the pronoun that you're asking me to use just to be kind, I, there's a part of me that wants to do that, but there's this other part that's kind of afraid to do that. Can you just speak to maybe the, the heart of that and it just about that idea of of the ground we give up and a yeah. should we be willing to give up ground as christians but also um yeah. are you concerned about a slippery slope idea there as well so there, there's a lot there but, but great question and i think it largely is due to how this conversation is so intertwined with politics and the culture war and that's where i've tried so hard to separate the ethical Christian conversation from the political conversation. It's not easy, especially, I don't know, I feel like I'm watching more news now than ever. And I get sucked into that vortex of outrage and, and, and partisanship and this and that. And, and I, I feel that tribalistic spirit welling up in me when, when I pay too close attention to that. So I, I'll just, let me be fair. I mean, let me just be even. If you're, if you lean conservative, make sure you're, elevating Jesus over Fox News. If you lean progressive, make sure you're elevating Jesus over like, every other outlet, CNN, MS, MSNBC, or whatever. I mean, it, it's, I, I think that whole idea that, that, that of giving up ground, I think, is largely because we're, we're bathing ourselves in the culture war of partisan politics. Um, Jesus, always good to start with him. Um, <laughs> you know, we see in the life of Jesus, he had a very, very high ethical standard, a very narrow ethical standard, a very difficult, nearly impossible ethical standard. I mean, look at the Sermon on the Mount. <laughs> you know, try, try to read through that in one sitting and then go do that. You'll fail before breakfast. Okay? I mean, it's, it, he had a very high ethical standard. He also radically loved those who fell short of that ethical standard. You know, and whenever we see Jesus encountering people who are marginalized because of maybe a sin they committed, or maybe it's just their social status, maybe they're a widow or a leper or whatever, whenever he encountered people who are marginalized, or maybe it was a really sinful person like a tax collector or an adulterer or whatever, he always front-loaded love. Like, he can preach a hard-hitting sermon that addresses greed and lying and cheating, but then when he meets a tax collector, the very person who is embodying all those things he says don't do, he reaches out and doesn't, like, go through the longer list of their sins. So this is where that, that beautiful tension of grace, truth, um, you know, I, I, I think we need to embrace that and really work hard at following that standard of maintaining that high eth ethical standard. It is a narrow road. And yet the, the door is wide open to anybody who wants to uh, enter into this adventure of walking with Jesus on this, on this narrow road. And typically Christians, whether you lean right, lean left, lean truth, lean grace, whatever you, whatever that balance is, you typically resonate more with one and not the other. And I think the best place to be, the Jesus place to be is to recognize where you, you know, where you struggle with most and, and, and really try to maintain that healthy Christ-centered balance. I don't know if I answered your question. That's, uh, that, that's good. I, I want to, I want to dial in that same, same content with uh, that, that idea with maybe a couple just rapid fire, real, real practical responses. I'll try to be quick with it. <laughs> yeah, no, it, I, it just in it, what I'm saying in that is just give us your opinion. It's okay to, you don't have to, uh, but so 
in that idea of being willing to being willing to front low love and 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 giving up love. So something like specifically, someone says, "Hey, could you use this pronoun for me?" Um, do you think that's something that a, that a Christian should be willing to do? Okay, uh, really good, godly, wise Christians on both sides of that debate, the pronoun debate. I do lean on, uh, not lean, strongly lean towards using the pronoun the person wants you to use. Language is shared social space, and we need to meet people where they're at, not assume that they need to have a an ironed out Christian worldview or even you know the, the correct view of language or whatever for us to be in relationship with them. Jesus didn't have that kind of posture. Um, and so I, yeah, meet people where they're at, use the term, uh, the pronoun that they prefer you to use. And, and again, I say that and really do wanna um, uh, respect and think through the counter argument that, well, you're just feeding delusion, you're, you know, you're lying to them. I don't think, I don't think it is lying and, you know, I'm not going to get into that, but um, yeah. One thing I know is if you want to immediately cut off a relationship with a trans identified person, then just refuse to use their pronoun. Okay. <laughs> just, if you want to end that relationship immediately, have no chance of embodying Jesus in that person's life, refuse to use their pronoun and boom, that relationship is gone. Um, so one other one, um, should we be willing to, if we have, um, somewhat conservative or tradition views of gender roles and um, should we be willing to give some ground there should we be willing to rethink those things a little bit yes i think most of our views of gender roles come from culture not the bible so when i say masculinity or femininity whatever came up in your mind there's a good chance that you don't have a verse in the bible that morally mandates masculinity or femininity we have examples of people like David, you know, killing a lion and slaying Goliath. Uh, but that same person, David, also played his harp and wrote poetry and wept over his best friend Jonathan when he died, saying, your love to me was better than the love of women. Like, he, he doesn't fit in this narrow box of masculinity and femininity. Neither does Jesus, who turned over tables in the temple and also wept over Jerusalem and turned the other cheek when people were beating him up. I mean... These cat again, I, I will say most men will probably naturally resonate with masculinity. Most, not all. Most women might gravitate towards femininity. Most, not all. And if you don't, that's okay. There's no moral, like masculinity and femininity as it's traditionally conceived is not morally mandated in the Bible. Like if you're a woman who doesn't want to have children, maybe you want to climb the corporate ladder, you're a hard worker, maybe you don't even want to get married, like, I don't need a man to take care of me, I'm going to go, like, there's, you're not violating anything in scripture. Um, we have Lydia in Acts 16, who was in the same boat, she was, you know, the seller of purple, a financial entrepreneur, you have women in Luke 8, 1 to 3, who funded Jesus's ministry, that was a very unmasculine thing for Jesus to do, and a very unfeminine thing for these women to do, and they're not, they're praised in that passage, so, um, yeah, so, so these are cultural um, stereotypes. Doesn't mean they're, they're, they're necessarily wrong. They're just not morally mandated from Scripture. That's wonderful. Uh, let's, uh, let's open it up. We've got a few people who signed up to be on the call and have a chance to ask a question. So we're going to open up for those folks now to go ahead and ask a question if you have one. Okay. Go ahead, Susanna. So how does the church, or is there a way, I guess, um, because I know a lot of LGBTQ Christians have churches that are kind of specifically for those communities because of how Christians have traditionally treated them, historically treated them. Um, is there a way to be affirming versus just tolerating? Um, I guess that's my question. Uh, for, for a more traditional church to be affirming, yeah, 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 I think there is. Um, you know, what's interesting is, yes, you do have churches that are uh, affirming of same-sex relationships that are very, you know, rainbow flags out front, like very clearly, like like we all means all. Um, what's interesting is even in, in the year 2020, when those churches are pretty plentiful, even if I'm in Boise, Idaho, there's several affirming churches, and we like, you know, this is like the most pro-Trump state. Like we're, we're a very conservative state, but we still have, no matter where you go, you're going to find affirming churches. So what's interesting is you still have lots of LGBT people showing up 
specifically at traditional churches. And the no, I, I, I've asked this question every single time and other pastors that I talk to in progressive cities say the same thing over and over and over and over. When they ask an LGBT person who's coming to their traditional church, when they have affirming options, they say, I want to come to your church because I want to hear the Bible taught. I want to hear the gospel preached. And affirming churches just go crazy when I say it. They're like, no, that, that's just impossible. And they have this very binary view that like, unless you're waving a rainbow flag, you're not going to attract LGBT people. I mean, my whole ministry exists and we're busier than ever because conservative or traditional churches have loads of LGBT people coming to their church and they're trying to figure out how to maintain their sexual ethic and, and be welcoming. So, so uh, my point, number one, um, I think there is a, a genuine spiritual hunger among LGBT people. They do want to know what does the Bible say. They do want to hear the gospel. They don't need just an over-the-top, you know, affirming message in the sense of like, you're not doing, you're not doing anything wrong. You don't need to repent from anything. Don't ever doubt anything about you. You're perfect. You're, you know, no, they, they know, and like any human, we're like, we know we're broken on the inside. You know, maybe it's our sexuality, maybe it's something else, who knows, but I, I, I want to hear an honest message about, you know, my journey. Um, also, you know, sometimes we, um, we think of LGBTQ as that means the person is affirming of same-sex relationships. But again, statistically, 20 to 25% of people who experience same-sex attraction or maybe maybe even identify as LGBTQ, about 20, 25% hold to a traditional theology of marriage. So that there's loads of people, and that's millions of people, millions of people who are attracted to the same sex who want to walk in faithfulness and what that looks like according to a historically Christian sexual ethic. So that's where I would say, let, let's at least begin there. Um, any average church is, might have, you know, a, a few dozen at least, if not, you know, if your church is over a thousand, you might have a hundred people who are wrestling with their sexuality on some level who are trying to figure out what is this, what does faithfulness look like? So, um, and, and I think there's absolutely a place of, you know, reaching out to the, to the kind of non-Christian, unchurched LGBT community. But there's, there's a lot of people even within our midst that are wrestling with this. Um, so I think, yeah, establishing a church culture, this is kind of a general statement, but establishing a church culture where if somebody, not if, but those that are wrestling with their sexuality, usually in private, feel safe and the freedom uh, to, to wrestle out loud in community. And, and um, yeah, I'll, more I can say on that, but. Uh, <laughs> I've got a question. So uh, the the identity piece, I deal a lot with uh, teenagers. So if you were to talk to them, they would say, yeah, I have a problem with stealing. Yeah, I lie. Yeah, I do these things. But they're also wrestling with the, with with their sexual identity. They don't label themselves a liar or a thief, but they do label themselves as, you know, bisexual, pansexual, whatever. How do we disconnect this need for it to be about your identity, who you are? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I, unfortunately, I don't know if I have a good answer, but just to agree with you that more than ever, Gen Z, people born you know, after 1995, um, have this, uh, exactly what you said, there is this unique quest for identity, uh, and especially when it comes to gender or their sexual sexuality, and that's that's almost unprecedented in in the in human history, really, to to have such a insatiable insatiable ser a search for your sexual or gender identity. The one thing we can't do is is re like on a on a relational level is is to kind of react too strongly to that, which can become really easy because I'll just say probably for all or a lot of us, I don't know. I mean, we kind of step back and see the danger of that and almost like, why? why? That's just going to lead to all kinds of other confusion and stuff. Like, what, why, why search so hard to wrap your identity around your sexuality? But we can't, like, come right out and kind of poo-poo that. Like, we need to meet people where they're at, recognize that they are swimming in these waters where that is just in the air. Um, so I think maybe slowly, uh, cautiously, and subtly, um, trying to build in patterns of, you know, finding your identity in Jesus, um, or even in, you know, just in our common humanity, not, not necessarily our sexual attractions. So just be really cautious about how aggressively 
we address what is, I would agree, is problematic, you know? Um, and I don't think it's, you know, I don't think it's necessarily sinful to, you know, identify by your sexual attractions. I just think it's typically un un unhelpful and can lead to just a misguided path to human flourishing, you know? Um, yeah. Um, do you want to follow up on anything with that? I just, I do recognize you. It's, it's a really tough, tough thing. And I know a lot of youth leaders are really wrestling with this. No, no follow up. It, it, I was hoping you had some yeah. nuggets. Yeah. I, I think why, well, um, the gen, specifically the gender identity piece. So whether it's trans or gender fluid or pan gender, or there's, you know, dozens, hundreds, even of gender identities, almost all of those identities are wrapped up with, uh, gender stereotypes. You know, why would somebody not just identify as a man? Well, I don't like sports and you go, you know, oftentimes it's just so wrapped up in the stereotype. So that, that's where, as we kind of address the identity piece, I would, um, it's really ironic actually that these gender stereotypes, they were forged in the halls of 20th century patriarchy and misogyny are being resurrected by so-called progressives, you know? <laughs> and it's like, wait a minute, this is why a lot of feminists, the, the loudest opponents of this whole kind of trend are radical feminists. Because <laughs> like, we've worked so long to put to death these gender stereotypes and the kind of hyper left progressives are resurrecting them again. Um, so I, I think not saying that, don't say, don't repeat what I said, but I mean, I, like maybe helping people understand you can be a godly man or just, you can be a man and, and, you know, prefer the halftime show over the Super Bowl. Like, you know, you don't need to find your identity in these gender stereotypes. You be you don't, don't, don't play into, you can almost turn it back. Like saying, don't, don't, don't be stuffed into some box of, you know, this, you know, certain gender role that you're trying to, you know, because you don't fit into it, you're trying to search for an alternative identity. You just be you. You don't need to be stuffed into this narrow box. So um, with sexuality, it's a little more, a little more complicated um, for various reasons. I, I know bisexuality, especially among teenage females is off the chart. Like I, I feel like I meet more bisexual teenage females than straight, you know, boring <laughs> uh, females. And there's, there's various reasons for that, I think, um, yeah. Any other questions as we wrap up here? It, we had a we had one chat question. Um, so someone's asking about uh, tr uh, LGBTQ pastors. So someone uh, who's actually in that in that in that role. Um, I don't know if 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 they mean people who uh, who are wrestling with it, um, working in in a traditional church, or if they just mean someone working in an affirming church. I don't I don't I didn't get that through the question. But if you just want to unpack that a little bit, if you could. How come I can't I can't see the chat? I have my chat open, but I can't see the question. Um, oh shoot! Sorry. Yeah. Um, I don't know. You want to just read it to me? Or? Yeah. It just says it just says please address the idea of trans slash LGBTQ pastors. Oh yeah, okay. Um, I don't, I, I almost need a more specific question. Um, yeah, they, they certainly exist. Um, and also, we, I mean, yeah. Can we, can we just focus in on the idea of, of maybe someone who's who's wrestling with that, but holds to a traditional view yeah, okay. and, 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 and being employed by a church, maybe. Yeah, I, I, I'm pretty passionate about this, I guess. I, I think if somebody is um, following Jesus faithfully, according to the sexual ethic that the church teaches, then there's no reason why, and say they're qualified for ministry, I, I don't see a reason why, a, a consistent, compelling reason why they should be excluded from ministry, from leadership, really. I mean, and I mean this from, from, with all my heart, some of the, the most godly, faithful people I know are gay or lesbian Christians who I think are following Jesus according to a traditional sexual ethic. I mean, think about it. Like my friends that are committed to celibacy in the year 2020, when they can ease, they're affirmed by culture. And now they can find a church that affirms them. They can find a, a, a church that, you know, sings Chris Tomlin worship songs and preaches through the Bible that affirms their, their you know, same-sex sexuality. 
they have that option. Culture is just surrounding them, affirming them. For them to say, no, because of my allegiance to Jesus, I'm going to commit my entire life to celibacy, even though I desperately want a romantic partner. Do you know any, do you personally know any straight people with that degree of faithfulness? Like who else would you want leading your church, you know? So this is why it really does irk me when churches, um, you know, wouldn't, you know, they, they would put a, there's a ceiling on how high that person can get in, you know, leadership or ministry positions. Like to me, that just, that sends a signal that, we're just being really, we'll employ a person who wrestles and fails with their opposite sex sexuality, which is mm, every church leader in the world, um, you know, but we wouldn't employ somebody who is wrestling with their same sex sexuality. And yet it's blatantly committed to faithfulness, you know, for various reasons. So I, yeah, I think um, if somebody is walking in faithfulness and maturity, then, um, then they're, even if they're wrestling with same-sex sexuality, if they're pursuing Jesus in that, there's no reason why they should be excluded from all levels of leadership that they're qualified to serve in. Um, now, if, if, they, if they don't agree with the church's ethical s- statement, then yeah, I would say the opposite. Like if anybody doesn't agree with the church's statement on sexuality or position, then I would say, well, I mean, of course they wouldn't serve in leadership. I, it, you know, I wouldn't apply for a job in an affirming church, obviously. Like I wouldn't, like, well, of course I shouldn't serve in that leadership. So vice versa. I wouldn't, uh, you know, I think leadership should be on the same page with questions, you know, surrounding sexual ethics. That's good. John, you want to bring this one home? Yeah. Thank you again, Dr. Sprinkle. Thank you guys for your questions and thanks for watching online. Again, we want to really open up conversation about this and continue to dialogue about it. So if you have questions, please let us know. We're going to be continuing to unpack these themes and explore them in community together uh, more so in the coming months. So um, again, yeah, thank you, Dr. Sprinkle, for all of your insight and your wisdom. My pleasure. Thanks for having me on. All right. Thanks, guys. We'll see you tomorrow night.